I'm going to be talking today about uh, digital money and payments, <clears throat> focusing to some extent on uh, the sort of evolution of cryptocurrencies, moving into what are called stable coins and uh, central bank uh, digital currencies, CBDC, and their impact on cross border payments and on enterprises and individuals. And uh, specifically, since this is the Center for Emerging Markets, also talk a little bit about uh, financial inclusion. Okay. And if you have questions, uh, uh, please uh, post them to the chat and uh, I will uh, answer them uh, after we get to the end of the talk. Uh, so all kinds of interesting things are happening in this world of uh, currency and payments. Uh, you probably saw just about a couple of weeks ago, Ant uh, Group's uh, IPO was uh, stopped by the Chinese government. Uh, and that was a 34 billion IPO, which would have given the company a market cap of about 330 billion. Almost simultaneously, the US Justice Department filed an antitrust suit to stop Visa from buying a company called Plaid, uh, which is a very small company. Uh, it was a $5 billion deal, which is almost uh, you know, chump change for a company like, uh, uh, <clears throat> like, uh, like Visa. And we'll talk about why that was going on. Uh, because of the pandemic, all over the world, customers are reluctant to use cash, physical cash, to handle them. And MasterCard noted that contactless payments rose to 41% uh, this year from 30% last year. Uh, and e-commerce transactions today in the US are around 16% of all retail compared to 11% before, which means clearly you need to think about payments online. And basically the world of payments is changing and it's creating problems for incumbents and for governments, right? So here are the main issues that I wanna talk about. First of all, how is money changing, right? I wanna talk about innovation in forms of money, particularly cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, and how that is leading into these uh, stable coins, wholesale and retail stable coins. I'll talk a little bit about digital currency risks and the problem of possible oligopolies of uh, digital currencies. Uh, I'll talk about central banks around the world, how this has caused some alarm and how they have started responding with pilots uh, with the intention of possibly launching essentially a digital dollar, a digital yuan, et cetera, what would be called central bank digital currencies as an alternative to all of these stable coins. And a possible uh, kind of mediation point between these two movements uh, with what's called synthetic CBDCs, where the government works in, in conjunction with stablecoin providers. Okay. Uh, and then we'll talk about the implementation issues, issuing these coins, the usage, uh, maintaining stable value, uh, the needing for reserves to back up these uh, uh, stable coins. Uh, cross-border payments and how that might change. And of course, issues relating to network uh, infrastructure and cybersecurity. Uh, talk about macroeconomic effects, which is actually a very important part of this whole phenomenon. How it's gonna affect monetary policy, monetary policy transmission and, and the ability to control monetary policy, as well as financial system stability and resilience. In other words, uh, these could pose systemic risks for the financial system. And so we need to be thinking about those. And then, as I said, implications for enterprises in terms of how will companies need to change uh, it to respond to this change in payments. and so Similarly, what does it mean for consumers and society? And I want to talk briefly about financial inclusion. All of the people around the world, particularly in, in bottom of the pyramid types of uh, situations who are unbanked and how might this affect their ability to be you know, included in the financial system, okay? So in terms of payments, you know, money is very, very old. It's been around forever. And ever since we moved away from barter, money has been critical to the growth of an economy. And so we begin with what's called most central banks around the world uh, insist that major financial institutions that are important to the economy, major banks, for example, in the US, hold central bank reserves. Okay? And this is often called central bank money. And the idea is that you hold reserves at the bank, uh, some percentage of your total money supply by your own what's called bank money, 
which is you know the borrowings and the deposits that a bank has. And as you know, the, the, there's an accelerator principle involved here, so that banks typically will hold, based on the Basel uh, Accord, uh, somewhere from 12% of equity plus a certain portion of their deposits or loans out as reserves as a way of safeguarding a run on the bank, uh, keeping high confidence in the monetary system, and being able to ensure the public that you know, your money is safe with us and that uh, we will never you know, have to uh, uh, renege on our uh, commitments, right? Of course, what's changing is now we're moving to various forms of synthetic currencies, what's called e-money, electronic money, which are fixed value redemption so that they don't fluctuate in value. So these are not cryptocurrencies. And in China, this has taken off $17 trillion worth of mobile payments, basically divided between Alipay and WeChat Pay. Okay, in Africa, there's a wonderful uh, development that's actually been going on for some time. Mpesa, uh, which is run by Safaricom, which is the monopoly in Kenya, and it has spread to Uganda, Tanzania, etc. And something like 90% of all Kenyans. Uh, use M-Pesa as a means of payment between uh, uh, individuals and, and with companies. And of course, the nice thing about these kinds of e-money is that it's very convenient. You don't have to carry cash around and worry about losing it or getting robbed. Um, Network effects are very important. So the more people use it, just like any other network, uh, the more the e-money uh, uh, use grows and therefore the wide acceptance creates a virtuous cycle. And then all kinds of extensions. That is, you can add uh, various functionality to these e-money transactions, uh, which allow different operators to, to essentially create new sources of income, as well as to improve the experience uh, for users. And of course, this is zero, and I'll get to some examples of this in a little while. Also, you have low cost, zero to low, very low transaction costs. Uh, and you know, the, the comparison is Visa, for example. When you use Visa as a merchant, uh, the cost is somewhere around two and a half to three percent between the cost of the visa network, the commission to the bank issuing the credit card to the consumer, and the commission to the bank clearing the credit card charge for the for the merchant. And of course, that includes, you know, some costs of network usage and security uh, and verification and so on. But much of that is a friction. It's the cost of running the global payment system. And these run very well, uh, but they are high cost. And so that's, I think, uh, you know, one of the big reasons why we're moving uh, to these new uh, payments uh, uh, innovations, right? And they can even be fun, these new systems. For example, if any of you, any of you use Venmo or Cash App or uh, uh, Square, things like that, uh, what's interesting about them is that they allow people not only to make payments, but also to tell the world about them. And so you can see, I went out a great meal with my friends and, you know, here's my payment and it was wonderful. Let's go back there again. And you share it with your social media circles. So consumption and payments become part of social interactions, not just, you know, the, the consummation of a financial transaction between people. And so that's a very interesting feature. It creates more data, of course, but it also changes why people might patronize certain forms of payment over other uh, forms of payment. And so we get to, uh, to cryptocurrency. Um, cryptocurrency is a form of blockchain, right? And blockchain is characterized by essentially immutability. That is, it's impossible to change when it's, once it's been recorded. Uh, it's highly secure. Bitcoin itself has never been hacked since 2009 when it was first established. Uh, that's because of uh, uh, all kinds of interesting uh, cryptography uh, and what are called consensus validation uh, approaches. It's also highly decentralized so that the classic form of Bitcoin blockchain, every node records every transaction. And so there's a permanent record of these transactions uh, all across the network. And uh, it's, a, it's also because it's a chain and it's immutable, you can trace back transactions to their origin. And so it becomes a, a source of uh, provenance. You can establish exactly all of the parties to the transaction across time and what they co uh, contributed. And therefore you can trace flaws or errors or, or problems when they arose and who was responsible for it. And this is particularly useful in applications like global supply chains. We have many different actors ranging from the merchant to the shipping agent 
division, the freight forwarder, uh, the customs people, uh, the, the letters of credit and bank issuance people, uh, you know, logistics at the receiving end, and then finally, you know, the client who, who ordered the consignment. So anyway, uh, blockchain is very, very uh, uh, valuable as a new technology uh, for commerce. And, uh, you know, there are some flaws, but that's not really what I'm getting into today. Um, it's not scalable. That's really the biggest uh, problem. But as yet, it's not scalable. But here's a Bitcoin as of yesterday. And Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. And if you want to use it as money, one of the first problems is that it is highly volatile. Money is supposed to be a store of value and a means of payment. So if you look at this here, as you can see very clearly, uh, Bitcoin putted along since its inception back in about 19, 2009. Uh, it really didn't, uh, you know, so during this period, it was pretty much like money, you might say. It didn't really change in value very much. And then suddenly you had this incredible spike up to about 19,000 and then a, a drop to 3.5, 3,500. And then back up today, it's at around 18,000. So when you have that kind of fluctuation in, in what is meant to be currency, it's really not going to be, valuable because merchants would be worried about accepting Bitcoin and then losing value. And people with Bitcoin might be worried about not getting the gains from the possible volatility. And so it's not really acceptable as yet as a popular means of trade. As you can see, only about 29 billion was the actual volume of Bitcoin used as opposed to 333 million billion market cap. It's only about 10% of Bitcoin is actually used in transactions, which is the opposite of most money. The amount of money used in transactions is as multiple of the total money supply, the actual money supply. Okay, um, so we come to stable coins, okay? And stable coins are fundamentally cryptocurrencies with the values maintained at parity to some reference, such as the US dollar. I'm gonna use Maker and the DAI as an example of this, just to explain you know, how a stable coin works. And there are many other stable coins out there, Tether, for example, US dollar coin, et cetera. Uh, but I think this would be useful just to understand the process. So the first point is that the stable coins are linked to a cryptocurrency. In this particular case, to ETH, which is the cryptocurrency created within the Ethereum blockchain protocol. So there are many different blockchain operating systems. One is Bitcoin, one is Ethereum, there's uh, Hyperledger Fabric, et cetera, et cetera. So what we have is Ether, uh, ETH actually, which is created within, within the Ethereum token. And that is deposited with this company called Maker. And the idea is once you deposit it with us, it is locked up <clears throat> in a vault within Maker, obviously a digital vault. <clears throat> and once it's locked, it is basically collateral and we can use it to create DAI. Okay? So you're converting the locked up ether, ETH into DAI. But the collateral ratio is fairly high. Currently it's around 150%. Okay? So that if I deposit 150 ether, I'm allowed to create the equivalent of 100 ether worth of DAI which would be at today's prices, let's say, if ether was worth 300, I'd be allowed to create 200 DAI. So why is that? Because Maker worries about the fluctuation in the value of the underlying collateral, the ETH, and by creating a very high uh, collateral ratio, you can try to create a margin of safety, which would allow you then to maintain the parity. A smaller collateral would make the system much more volatile and make it less useful as a stable coin. So that's why we have over collateralization. Okay? Now, Ravi, sorry, uh, just a, a couple of clarification. What is DAI? DAI is the name of the cryptocurrency. Just like Bitcoin is the name of a certain kind of coin, DAI is the name each, of the Each token is a DAI? Yeah, exactly. You can so buy a, a DAI. A DAI token are one to one. Yeah, at least in the maker protocol, the idea is I'm going to keep die at one die to the dollar. Okay, and then can you explain this collateral at one fifty percent again? Just okay, you right. take ETH, which is a cryptocurrency. You can buy it and sell it. So at some point, you have to exchange what's called fiat currency, the U.S. dollar or the euro or you know a Japanese yen. You have to exchange it on a cryptocurrency exchange to buy ETH. Once you buy it, you go and deposit it with Maker. And they say that if you deposit 150 Ether, we will give you the equivalent of 100 Ether, ETH, translated into DAI. 
and that die would be worth each die would be worth one dollar. And I'll explain how they maintain that collateral. I mean the the parity ratio. But the initial starting point is you take U.S. dollars, convert it into a cryptocurrency, and then further convert it into die, which is where the parity is maintained. So the idea is people could use die just like they use U.S. dollars, but it would be a cryptocurrency and therefore used in a very different fashion from the way we use die right now. It might become clearer if as I continue, okay? So here's where the interesting thing comes in. The moment I deposit the die, I can use it in different ways, okay? And the, so the funny thing is I've deposited ETH, I've created die. Now I can take the die out of that system and use it in any way I want. And essentially what I'm doing is borrowing the die, okay? The die that was, because I can put it into a savings account and earn a die savings rate. If I take it out, okay, I can lend it to somebody. So that there might be just like a bank, you know, where I am a depositor, I put money in the bank and then somebody comes to the bank and says, I'd like to borrow money. So the bank is lending out my deposit plus the deposits of a lot of other people to a borrower, okay? And of course the borrowing rate is higher than the savings rate. So what you're doing is now creating a parallel system to the way the US Federal Reserve and the banking system work. Instead, what you're doing is creating a parallel system where people deposit cryptocurrency, which is then converted to a crypto stable coin, which is then lent out at various interest rates. And the die supply will grow in relation to the demand for collateralized lending. So that as more and more people say, hey, and by the way, why would you want to borrow die? The answer is I'm not borrowing from a bank and therefore the, the requirements for obtaining credit are not the same. Banks perhaps have much higher uh, restrictions on how I can evaluate your credit worthiness to, to be able to borrow money. And similarly, you know, uh, I have less disclosure requirements. Essentially, that's one part of it, okay? That it's uh, much more of a, a kind of libertarian system, you know, where the idea is less regulation, less friction, you know, more uh, transactions at a decentralized level without a centralized intermediary. The bank is a centralized intermediary. We're going to get rid of that. Instead, we're going to have what's called P2P, peer-to-peer -peer lending. Okay, this is peer-to-peer -peer lending that's taking place, right? Because I deposit DAI, I mean, I deposit ETH, ETH I create DAI, and then I lend it out, right? And so if I raise the interest rate, just like a money supply where the bank, the central bank through monetary policy, open market operations raises the lower the interest rate. Similarly, by maker raising the stability fee, which is the interest rate charged to borrowers, will similarly have the same effect of improving, I mean, increasing or decreasing uh, the amount of debt that's going to be demanded. So that in a sense, I'm affecting total demand for borrowing and indirectly the money supply that is flowing into the economy through loans, okay? DAI is tradable on any cryptocurrency exchange so that if you type in into your uh, browser, you'll be able to immediately be taken to different exchanges where you'll see the price of DAI uh, and you can exchange it for whatever you want, right? Now comes a really key part, the arbitrage that is used to maintain the DAI to US dollar parity, okay? And that is the next chart here, right? How does DAI maintain the one dollar to one DAI ratio, right? I have created DAI and I have then lent it out, right? As a way of making some interest on my cryptocurrency. If the DAI price on the exchange starts falling below one, okay? Then I can go out and buy DAI on the exchange and immediately convert it to ETH, buy back that ETH. And then if I want to convert it into US dollars. And so I've made a small gain. Basically, I've arbitraged the reduction in the die value below a US dollar, slightly below parity, by using this process of arbitrage and converting it into US dollars once again. The die that I repaid is burnt so that the die supply goes down. And because the die supply goes down, when people want to borrow die, once again, you know, the die prices start going up. Okay, so this is one side of the arbitrage equation and similar process happens on the other side if the price of DAI goes about one US dollar, right? So it's a very interesting system that they have created. And this is true, not just for DAI, but it's also true for other stable coins. Okay? The same process applies. You know, we create an exchange, we allow people to deposit this uh, 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 cryptocurrency, we use it as collateral, 
to then allow you to borrow the stable coin and lend it out. And then we allow the market forces of arbitrage to, to bring the parity uh, back and forth. Okay, so that there'll be slight variations below a dollar or above a dollar. But if you look at the history of DAI, it's been pretty amazing at, at keeping uh, that parity. And here's another interesting thing. If the collateral ratio is breached and falls below that 150%, because the value of ETH itself fluctuates. After all, it's a cryptocurrency. So just like Bitcoin, ETH can fluctuate. So that if it falls below a certain level, there's automatic liquidation of the vault. So that the maker has an automatic system in place, which basically says, okay, we're gonna sell off the ETH, pay off the loan and give you any balance that's left over, right? And the reason they wanna do that is to prevent bad debts from overwhelming the system. Because if the ratio keeps falling, then maybe the amount of borrowing that has taken place is greater than the collateral ratio. So this is just like a house where the bank will lend you say 80% of a house. And if the value of the house starts fall falling so that you're, you're behind on your payments, they can sell off the house and at least get their 80% back. And even though the entire you know, uh, equity that the borrower had originally put in is lost. Okay? So it's the same principle being applied to uh, the DAI. Now, you know, it's, uh, a little bit hard to understand at first, I think, but it's useful to say, let's forget about the mechanisms, but just let's concentrate on the fact that we are creating a system of stability for a cryptocurrency to avoid the incredible volatility and its impacts of things like Bitcoin. So we're trying to move away from unstable cryptocurrencies to a stable coin. Avi, can I can I ask a clarification? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how how does this improve on the existing system where you're simply trading in dollars? Is the transaction cost much much lower? And if so, can you give us some idea how much lower? It's almost zero because there is really no transaction cost once you set up the network. You know there is what's called gas. You know gas is a way of charging for the cost of computing power. Okay, and gas is higher for things like Bitcoin because of the very complex validation system that's used in Bitcoin. They use something called proof of work that requires a lot of computing power. So because processing computing power is high, the gas cost is high for Bitcoin, which is another reason why Bitcoin is not being used very much in commercial transactions. With the DAI, you no longer have those kinds of processing costs. All it is is a ledger entry. You know, so it's almost in instantaneous. And so there's almost no cost to it. And, and if I use dollars, yeah, I mean, all, a lot of that is also just uh, hitting enter on a computer somewhere, isn't it? Well, what, and how much is that transaction cost? Just to give an idea. Getting at earlier, if I use dollars, uh, if I try to transfer like an uh, what is called electronic funds transfer from your account to another person's account, depending on your relationship with the bank, the bank will charge you fees for that ETH mm -hmm. transaction. Yep. If I use Visa or MasterCard, as I said earlier, yep. the Visa MasterCard is about two to three percent. American Express is even higher, four percent. Mm -hmm. And so, this system is designed partly with the idea that long term we will do away with the cost of payments to the point where you don't need an intermediary. Mm -hmm. so the real danger is companies like Visa could go out of business. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay. Now, what I was talking about was a retail idea. So there's also the idea of a wholesale stable coin, because remember, the whole concept of blockchain is highly decentralized exchanges, highly decentralized networks. But a lot of large institutions don't like the idea of being part of a completely decentralized network. Okay. And the smaller the network, the easier it is to conduct transactions within that network. So one idea that has come up in finance in this area of payments and cryptocurrency is why not create a stable coin only for certain institutions? So for example, uh, JP Morgan has created something called the JPM coin. And the idea is this will only be used for settlement between the members, the institutional you know, banking clients and institutional financial clients of JP Morgan, so that you'd have far fewer, but much, much larger entities working with each other. And here, the main point is that we want to create instant settlement, right? Facilitate instant settlement so that it doesn't take as much, because right now, one of the big problems with payments is that it takes two to three days, okay? And so when you move to instant settlement, you reduce the float, the amount of working capital that these companies and, and so on have to have, and also the risk exposure, because the time between the, the collection being 
a claim and the time that the claim is actually paid off, that is a risk factor, during which time there could be events that could make the counterparty uh, no longer able to pay. So that two or three days of, of duration is a financial risk that one side or the other side bears. And so there is a cost to that, which is attached to the cost of transfer. So the idea of this, this kind of JPM coin is we only have a few companies that are part of this. These are all major financial institutions, JP Morgan clients, and they then have a reserve account. And so what happens is that here's the actual members, you know, the various members of the ledger. So that JP Morgan will distribute their coin issuance, right, the JPM coin to certain members who have asked for it, right? And the client, by the way, has to maintain reserves, right? With JP Morgan in order to receive those uh, 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 tokens, if you will. And then those tokens are taken across the distributed ledger. So the transfer happens within the distributed ledger. And then the members who receive that transfer go back to JP Morgan and say, now I'd like some cash back. So the difference between using US dollars and using the system is this happens almost instantaneously as opposed to the old system. And the reason it can happen is because there are reserves maintained by each of these clients in the reserve account. And by the way, at the top above this is also JP Morgan maintains reserves, okay? Which are equivalent, you know, I'm sorry here. Uh, JP Morgan maintains reserves, which maintain this one-to-one -one ratio. So JP Morgan has, let's say a billion dollars in reserves. From that, they create a billion dollars worth of JPM coin and they make it available to all of the institutional clients on the basis that you deposit money with me, cash, you know, US dollars or euros, I'll give you the equivalent in JPM coin. It's up to you now to use it any way you want. But whenever you use it instantly, those people can then trade their JPM coins back to the currency that they asked for, US euros, et cetera, et cetera, okay? Ah, here's a good question. What's the validation process? Usually you need validation in decentralized networks because you don't know who to trust. But here, this is what's called a permissioned network. In other words, you can't join the network unless JP Morgan says yes. And that's how the trust comes in because JP Morgan has said, nobody can join the system unless they're willing to put in a certain amount of reserves. And then those reserves will determine how much JPM coin you can have access to. So they, they kind of finesse that whole idea of validation in typical blockchain uh, networks by saying, we create a much smaller permissioned uh, closed network and we govern it, we set the rules. Whereas in a decentralized blockchain network, governance is shared across all members of the network. Yeah. So that's another so, interesting step. Yeah, go ahead. Excuse me, so does that, does that change to be a centralized stable coin? It's not completely centralized a... because you do have a few members who participate in trading stable coins among themselves, but it is far more centralized than uh, the typical Bitcoin type blockchain. Okay, because you have fewer nodes and you have to be permissioned to join. And by the way, there's also access levels. Okay, you can decide what levels of access you can have within this network. Yeah. So the JPM coin might have a few institutions who are exceeding large, you know, which are called systemically important. So those might be given much higher levels of reserves and access compared to say some smaller uh, financial institutions that might be part of the JP Morgan institutional client network. So still, this is Alvaro. Uh, yeah. Why do we need the tokens? Why not use the same thing with the dollar and the uh, Thanks to technology, you don't have to have the same transaction costs as before. Uh, one thing is the token, another thing is the, the, the blockchain technology. Uh, what's the logic other than, hey, uh, criminal organizations are very happy because nobody knows uh, what is happening with this. And then the people who create them are making money by literally burning energy in uh, Estonia and Russia mining coins. Uh, What's the value of the, uh, the, of the big, tokens, not of the technology? The biggest issue is how do you translate that money into a digital representation of the money? Who do you trust? And so the validation process in Bitcoin is a way of making sure that the Bitcoin was created uh, in a legal fashion within the Bitcoin rules. 
Here in a permission network, you're trusting JP Morgan to say when I create a JP Morgan coin, it's exactly the same as the US dollar, but we can transfer this JP Morgan coin across borders. Whereas with US dollars and other currencies, you get into what's called the real time gross settlement system, okay, RTGS, and that slows things down because the moment you want to transfer across borders, you will run into that issue. And I'm going to get to that in a, in a few minutes. But the yeah. part is how can you trust transferring what is a real asset into a digital asset? A second thing is, this is something I read a long time. Uh, in Japan, people had uh, their Bitcoin uh, in wallets and uh, some uh, smart hacker got into the wallets and extracted several million dollars. And because these were Bitcoins, everybody lost uh, the money and there was nothing they could do. Whereas if this had been a bank, there is a, a, an insurance safe for losses and things like this. Yeah, totally. Uh, that is outside the Bitcoin or outside the blockchain network. Digital wallets are held by cryptocurrency exchanges, which is not part of the network. So that here, what's interesting is the JP Morgan coin is held within the JP Morgan network. Now, if these institutions had wallets outside the network, that is a totally different story because there then the security of the cyber exchange that holds the wallets is what matters. And most of the hacking that has happened is because those exchanges were not digitally secure. Now that is a general problem of all digital currencies. The individual who holds them has to have certain security principles. And I'll get to that in a minute, that unless individuals are educated enough to realize how to guard their private keys, because you have this handshake taking place between a public key and a private key, which is how transactions are authorized in any kind of cryptocurrency or digital currency exchange. If I'm not careful, just like with my password, if I'm not careful with my private key, I will either allow hackers to take control of my currency or I'll completely lose access to them because without the private key, you know, so there is actually a significant amount of Bitcoin lost. It's just sitting there in space that nobody knows how to access because the underlying private key is, is, is gone. Nobody knows where they are. Okay, it's been either permanently lost or forgotten or you know, put somewhere that people have forgotten how to access. Right? So that's part of it. I have a lot more things I want to talk about. So if you don't mind holding on, I'll come back to questions uh, a little bit later. Okay? So uh, the risk, you know, exactly that, okay? uh, that you have cybersecurity risks, and that is you know, partly the digital wallet risk. Uh, you've got the stability risk. Right? How do I maintain the parity? Uh, because if the reserves lose value, the ETH loses value, then of course the collateral is less useful and the, you could prejudice the stable coin. There's redemption and liquidity risk. Redemption risk of how do I know that maker has enough reserves to always uh, give me back the ether that I deposited in their vaults. So that's the sort of redemption risk. And then the liquidities of huge amounts of transactions all happen at once. Is there enough liquidity in the system to ensure that all of those transactions can be taken care of. And then therefore we, we need to think about segregated reserves. The reserves underlying the creation of whatever digital coin, stable coin are doing, have they been carefully segregated so they can't be used for any other purpose except for safeguarding the money supply that I've created through stable coins. And then lastly, this which I'm going to get to in the next slide, you know, bank disintermediation and macroeconomic policy risk essentially the risk in terms of monetary policy and uh, monetary transmission. The danger here is that if this takes off, banks would become less relevant because their function of savings and, and loans would disappear or at least be competed by these digital exchanges that are cropping up. Exactly the same functions can be rendered, but perhaps faster, less complex and at, at a lower cost. So uh, Facebook Libra, you've heard about probably. Uh, Facebook Libra was launched last year and it's probably the most serious threat in terms of stable coins because Facebook, first of all, uh, you know, uh, wanted to create a basket so that their stable coin would be linked, not just to the US dollar, but to a bunch of other currencies. And I think they even said commodities. So it would bring in an element of foreign exchange risk. Okay, it would fluctuate in value clearly because you had many different currencies inside the basket. Uh, they would take care of all of the transaction and data storage, validate transactions, etc. So you'd have to trust Facebook ultimately through its Libra blockchain to say, you know, we trust that you will do exactly, you know, the right thing in terms of all of these various uh, phases. They created an independent organization, they claimed, that would be based in Switzerland. And so it would be independent from Facebook. It would have its own governors, etc. It would be permissionless. So it would not be like JP 
Morgan saying you have to uh, ask us to join. If we, anybody could join the, the, the network. And uh, uh, it would create what is called self-sovereign identity so that each person would be given credentials that would be valid across the entire Facebook network. And by extension, therefore, to any merchant who wanted to join the Facebook network for commerce purposes, okay? And ultimately then what Facebook said was, we'll be able to bring the unbanked into the financial world because they'd no longer be unbanked. They wouldn't have access to the financial system. What happened was there's so much uh, pushback from governments that they moved to single currency stable coins and switched to a permission network. And here are some of the concerns that the governments raised. Number one, two plus billion members, right? That's a huge number of members. And if they all were given access to a Facebook stablecoin Libra, would that allow Facebook to dominate global payments? Because they would have control of cross-border transactions within the Facebook network, between merchants and between individuals, all within the Facebook network. And that was something that governments got very scared about. Not just the US government, but also European uh, Monetary Union and uh, European Central Bank and, and Japan and so on, right? Would it give Facebook a huge uh, control over monetary policy, okay? Because they could decide essentially how much loans to, to allow on the top of the reserves that were created through deposits, uh, creating labor. And so if it's 2 billion people, uh, that would mean a significant impact on the total money supply across the world. And so that became a particularly big issue for smaller nations and emerging markets, but also in general for the global monetary system. They could also restrict currencies traded on the network. And so there was a question of interoperability. You know, what if they decided we'll only accept the following six currencies? Then all of the other countries, what would they do in terms of being able to continue to uh, operate uh, effectively? Their currencies would no longer have value outside their countries and that became an issue. Of course, the hacked Libra wallets, the point that Alvaro just brought up, uh, that Libra would be in charge of the wallets and if they didn't do a good job, that could create problems. And so we come to the proposal. All of the central governments then got together and there's over 70 pilots taking place. The Bank for International Settlements in Geneva uh, kind of coordinates this. So if you look at their website, you'll see that there are over 70 central bank digital currencies being piloted by major banks around the world, the Bank of Japan, the uh, Reserve Bank of England, uh, Bank of Canada, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna cover what exactly is a CBDC and why it might be the way that the system will, will evolve over the next few years, okay? So why do we want a central bank digital currency? Number one, governments do not want to lose control of their financial system, okay? They're very concerned that all of these uh, new for-profit players uh, from different countries might start exerting influence over the total payment system and ultimately money supply, interest rates and monetary policy. They also want to prevent systemic risk. Systemic risk is what happened in 2008, where because of the Lehman Brothers collapse, you know, it was a domino effect and there's a danger of the entire financial system uh, coming to a stop. And so the regulation that came out of it was systemically important financial institutions have to be more closely regulated by the Federal Reserve in the US and similar organizations in other countries. And so the question was, how do we start regulating these new organizations if they start issuing stable coins in, in very large uh, numbers? There's also the domestic autonomy issue. How do we maintain autonomy over our currency? So the US dollar, obviously the US government determines the total amount of US dollars in circulation, how much of it is outside the US, and that's ultimately you know, the long-term trends. Of course, there's the vehicle currency issue, which is a slightly separate thing. And then, as I said, control over money supply, interest rates, and monetary policy. So what they're saying is, instead of having private stable coins, why don't we have government controlled and issued digital currencies? So that the government actually gets in the act and says, we can issue digital dollars. And so you don't need to use make a die or a Bitcoin or Tether, any of those. Instead, you can just start using our digital currencies. It would offer instant settlement as compared to two or three days. Now the Fed does have in the US a program called Fed Now, and that is supposed to cut down on the transaction settlement time. So they're already doing that with the traditional US dollar without moving to a digital currency, which is kind of, I think what Alvaro was hinting at, do we really need to move this far? But many of the central banks of the world are thinking about, is it better to move to a digital fiat currency issued by us rather than trying to create 
systems to speed up the existing network using you know, traditional uh, money. And most important is how can we make payments more efficient, faster, uh, less complex, and of course, uh, less costly. There's also the fact of trust that at least in some countries, the governments are highly trusted, at least at the level of monetary policy. So the you know, Federal Reserve uh, would be highly trusted in the US. Similarly, perhaps with the ECB and the, and the Bank of Japan, uh, Malaysian, I mean, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, et cetera. So the thought was, if we replace private for-profit entities with government money, digital currency, that could create a much more you know, stable environment because people will be confident in the system. However, there's one interesting question privacy, because the government would now have much greater visibility into all economic transactions. They have to voluntarily try to prevent, not, uh, prevent them from knowing how individuals are spending money. Because the moment you create a digital currency, it is programmable. So what you used it for can be found out from the moment that you spend it. Okay. So it's a bit like a credit card statement. When you get a credit card statement, it lists every merchant you you did business with. So if you combine the credit card statements of everybody in the US and gave it to one authority, you'd have a pretty good glimpse of how individuals and entities spend money and a very good idea of how commerce is conducted in the country for both products and services. And that becomes an issue in terms of privacy. Do we want um, US governments to have that level of, uh, or any government really, to have that level of, uh, of uh, uh, knowledge. Okay. Um, so Two this, comments. Yeah, go ahead. Um, to what extent are we going back to what happened 200 years ago when central banks replaced the ability of individual banks to issue currency? Mm -hmm. And uh, as far as I know, Hong Kong is still provides that to three banks, uh, you can, they still have the, the ability to issue their own currencies. And then the second thing on privacy, uh, does it really matter? <laughs> because if you think about it, well, uh, WeChat and uh, Alipay know everything about you or your Apple Pay or your credit card company knows everything about you. Yes, we are so worried about the government, but hey, why is it that we are not worried about private companies knowing everything uh, about us? Um, what's the difference here? Uh, I would say two things. One, each private company has a slice of your knowledge, but not 100% knowledge. But with only one digital currency, which is a national digital currency, and everything going through one ledger, uh, it is a central source of, you know, let's say, all of the information from Facebook, all of the information from MasterCard and Visa, all of the information from the bank where you hold your mortgage, the brokerage account where you do your stock trading, uh, you know, whatever else uh, you have, all of that is aggregated into one place. So that's one thing. As far as the first comment goes about, you know, how in 200 years ago, uh, in the US too, you had lots of different entities issuing banknotes and then gradually it became one. I think, again, the same reason that we want to increase confidence in the system, reduce counterfeiting, uh, make it more uh, frictionless to, because when you had multiple currencies issued in the US, uh, some currencies were accepted because people trusted those issuing locations and others were less trusted. So you created some issues where people would say, I wanna pay you with this. And the answer would be, no, I wanna accept that. So can you pay me with something else? And so you wanna to try to reduce that kind of issue where certain stable coins are more desired than other stable coins. And you have tiers uh, of uh, acceptance. And so by removing all of that and saying, here's one answer, you know, we can get to perhaps a more efficient system. Actually, we're going to be, talking a little bit about what's called synthetic CBDC, which is where I think your point becomes addressed because the governments of some countries are saying, why not work with stablecoin providers? You know, so that we'll create a joint system between private stablecoin providers who compete with each other, but ultimately work with one digital currency. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. So anyway, this is from the Bank of England, which issued a discussion paper in March of this year. I think it's a very nice graphic summarizing all of the reasons why they think a CBDC, central bank digital currency might be useful. We've talked about a lot of them already. One is make a better landscape for payments, avoid the risks of private money, support competition, efficiency and innovation by using, by the way, the synthetic CBDC. So you'll still allow innovation to happen at a second tier, okay? Meet the needs of a digital economy. I was talking earlier about how more and more of the world is moving away from cash and moving to more and more e-commerce. So clearly the world is going to need much more in the way of those kinds of payments. So this would be a step in that direction. 
improve the availability and usability of central bank money. So this is a bit of tautology because if I issue central bank money, then of course I need to make sure that it is highly usable. But they claim that this is important as part of the systemic uh, reduction of systemic risk. And I already mentioned decline in cash. And finally, this one, cross-border payments. Right now, this is one of the biggest problems in world trade, in e-commerce, et cetera, that it's very slow, very opaque. Nobody knows exactly what the exchange rate will be. You don't know when the payment will be finalized, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So with the possibility of central bank digital currencies and a very nice scheme of collaboration, which I'll show you in a minute, you might be able to actually come up with a much more efficient, much more lower cost payment system. And so, uh, you know, here's some issues that I've talked about. The biggest question is, you know, this, is the central bank good at doing this? Okay. Because you're talking about managing customer relationships ultimately. So the central banks of the world are very perhaps uh, high-minded organizations with a very strong mission, but they don't really deal with people. They deal with very major financial institutions. So suddenly, are you going to allow uh, US Federal Reserve to move in the payment chain of the entire economy and manage a payment app for millions of customers and do things like operating a network, uh, deciding what kinds of technologies uh, would be ideal, thinking about customer interactions, app development, brand management, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I think that's a very tall order. Can they be as innovative as Alipay, Paytime in India, or PayPal here in the US, right? There are a lot of very interesting things going on with payments using traditional channels. And so is it better to work with them and move to a digital currency or only try to dominate it yourself, right? And as I said, there's a lot of pilots going on. Here are some examples of pilots. And China, of course, is probably, the, I think, the first country that's likely to introduce this, a digital yuan, for many reasons. One, they've publicly said that they wanna dominate in terms of blockchain technology and usage. The second is the privacy issue. They would actually like to have more insight into what Chinese uh, citizens are up to. And with one single digital yuan, they would have even more of a window. And the recent uh, Alipay uh, and financial you know, stopping of the IPO is I think a clear indication that they don't like the idea of having private enterprise gain so much uh, influence over the monetary system. And so you know, they're really talking about raising uh, the reserve requirement for uh, Ant from 2% to 30%. So then Ant typically only held 2% of the total number of uh, uh, transactions that they financed within the Ant uh, uh, e-commerce network. The remaining 98% was farmed off to other banks, so the risk was farmed off. And what they felt was that was not right, that Ant needed to take more responsibility. So the newer regulations, which are not yet uh, defined, but they're being talked about, and would be asked to, to hold 30% as its reserves in order to finance those kinds of transactions. And given that Ant uh, you know, is the biggest player in China between Ant and, and WeChat, they control 90% of mobile transactions. That would be a huge change in the way uh, these uh, e-commerce uh, payments uh, systems are being run. So this is what a synthetic, uh, so anyway, this is the platform model that they have. So you'd have users, right? All of us, you'd have a whole bunch of competing providers. So these would all be competitors, okay? They would all be competing against each other and they would have APIs to go to the CBDC, okay? So this is how they envisage the system that you allow Facebook Libra to compete against DAI, to compete against Tether, maybe ETH, whatever. Anybody can come and create their uh, system and try to get, grab clients. But at some point they would have to work with the US government or the European government, et cetera. And they will be the only ones allowed to interact with the central ledger so that you'd reduce the number of people that the CBDC would have to interact with, but then allow these people to be very creative and innovative and add all kinds of additional features. For example, if I'm going to be promoting my particular uh, payment app using the digital dollar, I might say, I'm gonna allow you to create a, a gift card so that whenever you use my payment, automatically an option is presented to allow that customer to spend a little bit extra on buying a gift card, which would be in, by the way, in digital dollars. Or I will allow you to immediately offer a loan to that person so that if they're buying something, you know, point of sale loans are very popular these days. So that if I'm buying a, you know, big uh, uh, backyard uh, pit to have a fire in the winter so that I can still entertain guests, you know, that might cost three or $400. The idea is instantly when that kind of payment opportunity presents itself, that API would allow that individual company with the help of the innovative uh, app behind him to say, would you like me to offer you a point of sale loan? And the app would automatically, you know, 
draw in the data to decide how much of a loan to give, right? So these would be the kind of innovations that could happen in payments, but the idea would be still, you'd only have one currency and that would be the digital dollar. So then how would that work? The issuer would have to deposit reserves so that for the first time, you would open up central bank reserves to these private entities issuing stable coins. So this would be very different from the existing system. Very, very few institutions that are deemed systemically important are currently allowed to interact with the Fed and through open market operations and repo overnight uh, Fed fund loans, et cetera, uh, increase and decrease the supply of central bank reserves to keep the system you know, at a reasonable uh, secure level. So this is, I think, the biggest change that the Bank of England and some others are proposing. Allow private enterprise to flourish, but at the same time, bring them into a world of one single digital currency for a nation, such as a digital dollar. And the way they do that is by creating a three-tier system uh, with a fair amount of innovation, and but controlled at the same time by one single you know, uh, Federal Reserve in order to control those systematically important issues, et cetera. I have a lot more to go. I will be handing out uh, to all registered participants a PDF of all of my slides. There's probably another 10 or 12 slides. So um, let me do one more thing and then I'll take a few questions. I was talking about cross-border payments, right? So this is how the world, this is again a pilot that was being done between the Monetary Authority of Singapore, Bank of Canada and Bank of England. And it's a fascinating idea because what they're really trying to do is reduce the friction and increase the speed and reduce the transaction cost of uh, uh, cross-border payments, right? So as you can see, these are numbered. So I'll just walk you through the various numbered steps so you understand how this might really uh, change the system, right? So the first step is you have what's called the traditional RTGS platform, okay? RTGS is a system where, you know, you want to guard against the risk of settlement agent failure. Because remember, I said it takes a few days. So there's a danger that the settlement agent could fail, right? So instead, what you do is use the recipient country's central bank and its reserves. So all of the transactions from both sides, incoming and outgoing, are channeled through the RTGS. And it's a gross settlement system so that you net out all of the transactions and then you decide how much has to be safeguarded. So you go to the system here and that's the first step. You use the traditional platform. And so I, you know, working for a client would deposit the currency in that system. That is transformed into the central bank's digital currency, right? Through a, a central bank uh, wholesale uh, platform, which is in turn is given to the bank. So the bank then sends it over to the bank in the recipient country who represents the client who's supposed to receive the money, okay? They go to their central bank, which then goes to the central bank platform between the two countries to say, okay, you know, I'm gonna give you the CBDC that you issued and I'm gonna get currency of my country. And then that goes back to the final recipient. So the heart of it is really two things. One, that within a country, you have a way for a wholesale central bank operation to, uh, uh, to work. And then between the countries, you have a second platform, which is called the universal CBDC exchange. So the idea is if we can create these two systems simultaneously, the entire cross-border uh, netting system that is currently costly, it takes two or three days. We don't know what the exchange rate is, when it will actually be finalized, et cetera. All of that could be reduced to, literally to the way when you pay on Venmo. You know, you put in the name of the, your friend and you put in the amount and the next minute it shows up in that person's account and it's taken out of your bank account, right? So that's a really amazing thing. What Venmo does and what these new exchanges are doing is what's called account to account. You don't need Visa anymore because I can transfer from my bank account to you, from my bank account to, to, to a, a merchant, et cetera. And the reason banks have traditionally hated this is because of the security issues. Once I give access to a person's bank account to a third party, what is to prevent fraud and so on from hacking? I mean, from happening, right? And so these kinds of, uh, of initiatives all happen within the cryptographic uh, high security of a blockchain uh, uh, network, right? So I'll stop here because as I said, there's a lot more to go, but I'll send out the PDFs later on. I'll be happy to take questions later, but let me take the last few minutes to see, uh, you know, what, uh, what else you might want to ask me. Ravi, Eli here. Yeah. Very, very fascinating topic. Uh, love the presentation. Um, 
I was thinking, listening to you, it seems to me, knowing that banks are never in the business of losing money, right? It seems to me that the central banks of the world seem to be pushing hard against the concept because uh, they're trying to stay relevant. They see that uh, decentralizing the, the, the stable coins uh, in all these issues you mentioned, security, yes, they are they're launching arguments, yes, for security reasons and uh, I, I think I even, I've even heard um, central banks saying don't go with on a stable coin because that's a, that, that makes the focus on stability, which necessarily may not be the case and may lead to bank runs in the future and so forth, right? So they, it seems to me they're providing arguments against the stable coin um, phenomenon so that they can push toward the centralized bank, central bank um, version of it so that they can be the ones providing the stable coins rather than the decentralized peer-to-peer. -peer. Is that right. more in, in sense? Because remember, the whole idea of Bitcoin is it came out of a libertarian idea in 2008. Yeah. When yeah. the world was collapsing, they said, we don't trust central banks. We don't yeah. trust governments. So let's create a system that is completely independent of countries. Yeah. But by doing so, you also created this dark net. You know, tremendous opportunities for money laundering and, and human trafficking and financing terrorism, etc. So the governments are now saying by creating a digital currency, which would be subject to all of those KYC to anti-money laundering uh, regulations, etc. So today, if I have a cyber currency and I want to exchange it on a US-based exchange, the exchange has to report to the uh, US government, to the US Treasury, who it is. They have to do a KYC and they have to have those anti-money laundering and, and uh, counter-financing of terrorism uh, already in place. So they can't escape that. Outside the US, there's not as much regulation as yet. So I think the CBDC idea is a way to prevent this libertarian ethos of a completely independent payment system. There's also a tax issue because the more you can escape the scrutiny of the authorities, the more likely it is you can also evade taxes which is a very big question for all governments, not just the US. How do we make sure we collect enough taxes to sustain the system that, the minimal system that we need, you know, in terms of education and health and retirement pays and social security and so on. Aside from things like defense and, you know, those other areas, right? There's a certain minimal level of government provisions of common services. Uh, and so how do we make sure that we still have access to people's incomes so that we know how much to tax them? So I think the CBDC is not only about, you know, we don't want stable coins. It's partly about how do we maintain a global financial system that is reasonably uh, stable because otherwise people lose confidence. Money is ultimately, you know, a social contract between people. We all agree that this piece of paper called the US dollar has value, right? It's a social contract. Yeah. And so if we move to stable coins and one or two stable coins have huge problems very suddenly, it's going to cause havoc. So the central banks are looking ahead and saying, we don't want systemic financial risk to happen because of stable coins. So that's why we want to move to CBDC. Now, the other side of it is there's all kinds of interesting research questions that arise out of this. So maybe after I circulate my PDFs to you of the slides, we can have another conversation later about what are some of the ways in which, you know, uh, this creates interesting research directions for strategy and for international business. And also for marketing, by the way, because there's also a marketing question. How do people become convinced to start using things like stable coins and, and digital currencies rather than their credit cards and their debit cards? Uh, that's also part of it. We have a question from Mr. Ford. Yeah. How will this be affect how will this be affected by government regulations tracking? Currently, from one. Oh uh, yeah, as I was saying, the U.S. government and the European, uh, you know, Monetary Union, Japan, and even China, I think, are all very keen on maintaining the KYC, which is the heart of all tracking. Okay, once you maintain know your customer, then you're also able to figure out what is the money is being used for by that client. And so then the bank is required to report. And so I'm sure the same uh, regulatory levels will be applied to all of these stablecoin transactions, whether it's private stablecoins or CBDC. They'll be required to report. Uh, now the identity question, what's nice is within this system, you can have one identity for a person that is valid across the world, what's called self-sovereign identity. You'll only have to prove your identity once and there'll be a central kind of validation agency where you can have, uh, you know, uh, 
what's called zero knowledge proofs, where you don't have to give out the full driver's license with all of the details. All you have to do is say, you know, here's this agency that has my driver's license information and they can validate for you that I do have a driver's license and that I my age is over 21 years because people use the driver's license as proof of age, right? And proof of identity. So, you know, the idea of zero knowledge proofs is create one identity that's valid worldwide, but requires minimal disclosure of information to third parties and is controlled by the person owning the identity. So I tell the validator that so-and-so has issued a request to make sure that I have a degree from Northeastern, tell them that you have the certificate from Northeastern or go to Northeastern and Northeastern validates that yes, we gave them a degree, but we don't have to tell them anything more than the fact that they received a degree in economics from us. So that's the idea of SSI, which would, I think, address this issue of how will government regulations track currently from one country to another. What it will require is collaboration. All these different governments will have to come together and start accepting this. Uh, and Alvaro mentioned Estonia almost as a flippant comment, but Estonia is actually at the forefront of many of these, uh, uh, of these initiatives in terms of trying to use self-sovereign identity and blockchain-based technology for offering many kinds of very useful government services. Uh, I think Leon, Leon Lee had a hand up. Yes, he, um, the question from Leon is, may I ask question about the implication to monetary police, especially from the perspective of quantity of money? Okay, that's a great question because the whole idea of bank loans and reserves is that bank loans are some multiple of deposits. So that if a bank has 10 billion in deposits, they might create 30 billion in loans on the principle that not that all of the 10 billion is going to be taken out at any one time. And in order to prevent a run on the bank and allow the central bank, you know, the Federal Reserve to help a bank if it is in a crisis, that's why we have central bank reserves, okay? So stable coins and the maker system, for example, that I explained the DAI system is very similar to the idea of a bank because DAI is created on the basis of reserves deposited by individuals with a high collateral ratio, but then the DAI is lent out. And as long as the collateral ratio is high, you've got safety in the system. And so one of the principles that CBDC is based on is we no longer have to rely on private entities maintaining high collaterals and reserves. Instead, we can move to one national currency, which becomes the basis of these kinds of transactions, which in turn also means we determine the growth of money supply, not individual uh, stablecoin providers. Thanks so much, um, Professor. May I ask a follow-up question, please? Uh, um, thank you. Um, that's me who asked the first question. So as you know that uh, in the, I, I'm very fascinated by example which you mentioned about JP Morgan um, coins. As you know, in the US, we have the FedEx, which FDIC. And in the Europe, um, there always have been a dream to create kind of banking union. However, uh, many scholars argue that was never completed because there's not a similar program such as um, guarantee programs as such as FDIC in the Europe. Do you mm -hmm. think a stable coin can be a solution um, to solve as a um, mechanism transaction between the banks, which has the which are in the balance sheet of ECB, in order to solve these uh, issues and complete the banking union? The last step. So you're asking whether because Europe lacks depositor insurance the way the FDIC gives depositor insurance in the US, you're asking whether a move to stable coins will finesse that issue and in a sense provide depositor insurance? Is that what you're asking? Um, sort of. And the other the kind of reason that um, FDIC kind of program was never um, being solved because in the Europe, because the heterogeneities and money, for example, in Italy, the banks um, had a very different balance sheet um, um, compared to Germany's. So that's the kind of trust of um, how much, it's kind of every country issue your own money is um, based on the relationship with ECBs and or your own sovereignties. However, because those banks are so like, um, bank related to its own country's um, characteristic, um, savers from the North might be reluctant to invest in the, in the South. But if we have a stable coin and everyone gets the same kind of shares, um, that the confidence will be improved and then the economy of Europe can really take off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I'm thinking that once you, move to, if we move to uh, easy cross-border uh, payment facilitation, 
Concomitant play is going to be much easier to exchange one digital currency for another so that people who own digital euros could very easily in a relatively costless, uh, quick and you know, transparent fashion trade their digital euros for digital dollars, etc. So I think that kind of ease of exchange between currencies, you know, reducing friction might also make it possible for people to say, oh, uh, I don't need deposit insurance in, the, in Europe because I can use the US deposit insurance system to convert what I want to protect into digital US dollar deposits. So I can see that as being, I mean, it's an interesting idea. I haven't thought about it much, but I can see that as being one avenue for causing harmonization, if you will, of uh, major banking systems around the world because of the ease of uh, uh, cross-border facilitation. Thank you so much. Um, one last question. Does that mean that um, the stronger the country is, for example, the US, um, because kind of harmonizations, you know, the weak going to the stronger and because the confidence in the Fed is so strong, the US dollar will be even stronger in the futures or we think um, the, the, the dollar oh. of the future will decline in the future eventually? Actually, this is a very good question because there is a fear that this could create what are called islands of digital currency. Because see, the digital currency is going to be created by a government which have a certain set of rules around that digital currency. So for example, the digital yuan that the Chinese government is creating and will probably launch, say in the next uh, 12 to 18 months, might come with certain uh, 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 advantages so that people who trade with China might say, I'm going to start using the digital yuan. But then there might be other countries, such as the US government, which might say, no, you cannot use the digital yuan in certain transactions with us. You have to use the dollar. So what you're going to create then, I suspect, and this is, again, a bit of speculation on my part, you're likely to create islands surrounding certain major digital currencies. So it won't be like only one or two will dominate the world. But I can see that the US dollar's position as a vehicle currency could decline to some extent over time and be supplanted and be complemented by more than one digital currency. I can see that happening very much because of the ease again of, uh, of cross-border payments and, uh, and the possibility of attaching conditions, what's called programmable money. You can attach conditions to these digital currencies which might make them more or less attractive depending on who's using them and for what purpose. So I can see very easily a condition saying to, to get certain kinds of uh, exports from China, you have to pay in digital yuan. So I think that would be something to explore. Certainly from a research perspective, I think that would be a fascinating issue to, to think about and explore, and maybe even simulate you know, what might be the consequences of creating these islands of, islands of uh, digital currencies. Thank you very much, Professor Sarathi. Uh, we're running 